And we're back. Welcome back, guys. This episode is a little longer than what I had originally planned, but I do try to accomplish a lot, so I hope you enjoy it. I spent about the first 10 minutes reviewing some of the some of the concepts that I've introduced in previous episodes. If it's not really your cup of tea, you want to fast forward through that, that's fine. And so, this is the rise of colonialism and the fall of Acre. Enjoy. Jerusalem has long been the focal point of the still unsolved problem of Palestine. There is no Palestine, no Palestinians, there never was, there never will be. Napoleon's invasion of Palestine is often thought of as the moment colonialism first dipped its toes into the Holy Land. In fact, I think even I've kind of sold it as such. While it is true that Napoleon's invasion represents a massive, massive escalation in European colonial ambitions, the invasion was not the first time that Europe attempted to get involved in modern Palestine. So to start this episode off, we are going to shift our focus from Palestine to Europe to get a sense of what's happening there and why the powers of Europe gravitated toward Palestine. This has been the most difficult episode to put together so far because I need to tie together two places, and two groups of events that correspond chronologically, but as they unfolded, were only related to each other tangentially. I mean, to explain what is happening in Europe from the 17th to early 19th centuries and how it relates to Palestine, I will need to revisit some of the things that I've passingly mentioned in previous episodes. What I'm going to do here is talk a little bit about our modern world and try to work backwards in time as gracefully as I can. I want to start off by talking about the nation state as a concept. In our time, words like nation, country, state, nation state, they're all kind of used interchangeably. And that probably has something to do with how successful the nation-state model has been in forming the world that we live in. For most people, describing the global order is a little like asking a fish whether it recognizes water. Asking someone to describe the nation-state would probably prompt the questioned individual to respond by asking, as opposed to what? So humor me for a little bit here as I do my best to explain this. One way to understand the nation as distinct from other types of groups is as a group that tells a common story about itself and that is bound to a particular geography. This common story is also referred to as a national narrative. And defined this way, the nation is distinct from just a people such as the Roma people, for example, who are bound by a common identity and a common story, but who are not necessarily bound together geographically, or for whom their sense of place is not of central importance. Now, every nationalist, every nationalist and every national movement would like to believe that their nation is as old as time and that the roots of their nation emerged just mere moments after the Big Bang, 
But the reality is that nearly all national narratives are A, pretty new, relatively speaking, and B, even those that are relatively old are constantly changing and redefining themselves. These national narratives contain similar elements. And I mean, if the nerds out there want, I can do a specific episode on on that. But the key theme of a national narrative is that it delivers a common understanding of the past and present and a common vision for the future. A state, by contrast, is an institution, specifically an institution that possesses a monopoly on violence. Now, I've mentioned this in previous episodes. And at the time that I discussed this concept, I shared the pragmatic considerations that may motivate a nation, that is the group, to submit to a state, that is the institution. Those pragmatic considerations namely come in the form of a desire to take violence out of the hands of the individuals in the group, the individuals that form the nation, and place it in the hands of a state in the hope that the state will use that power responsibly. But in order for that transaction to happen, in order for people to surrender their right to violence, the state and all of its institutions need to be written into the mythology of the nation. And that, that right there, is the nation state. It is the institutional manifestation of the nation. It is the ethos of the nation expressed through the tools of coercion like a standardized education system, infrastructure, courts, police, military apparatus, all those expressions of the the state. Look carefully enough, wherever you are, wherever you're listening from, look carefully enough, and you will start to see the biases and prejudices of your nation expressed in those institutions in things as simple as postal codes and zip codes and municipal planning. Now, that may have made sense to you, and I mean, it may make sense to me, but if it didn't, I apologize. There really is an easier way to understand this concept, and that's by contrasting nation-states with their failures, When these institutions fail, these state institutions, when the state is no longer able to maintain its monopoly on violence, we call this a failed state. That's a pretty well-known concept, and we've seen failed states all over the world. And and, and unfortunately, Somalia often is probably the most famous example. It's the one that often comes to mind. And perhaps less widely discussed, though, is the idea of a failed nation. That is, when the state and its institutions work just fine, but the story of the nation itself no longer unites its membership. Think about this. Yugoslavia existed from the end of World War I until about 1992. For large swaths of that time, the state was unimaginably strong. The nation, on the other hand, the idea of a Yugoslav people, failed to compel the citizens of that that state. And so Yugoslavia, the state, persisted right up until the nation could no longer see itself manifested in the institutions of the state. The very story of Yugoslavia no longer represented its membership. One thing to consider, before I move on, when I really start to connect this to to Palestine, one thing to consider is whether or not we're witnessing this very thing play out in America. I mean, if you look closely, you'll notice that American state institutions are actually doing more or less just fine. The institutions are continuing to do their job effectively, but the story of America itself, 
is beginning to fracture into competing and potentially irreconcilable narratives. Well, once these stories collapse, peoples and nations, they don't just simply give up their search for meaning. They don't just roll over and die. No sooner does one story collapse than another emerges to take its place. And with that, we can turn our attention to Europe. Our trip to Europe will generally focus on two places, Britain and France. Russia will come into the story later, but I'll have to save that for another episode. And this actually, I mean, it's despite the fact that the first act of European intervention into Palestinian affairs came in the form of a Russian warship during the time of Zahar al-Umar. But since that incident didn't really result in anything too meaningful in the time, I think it's best we leave it for now. In the case of Britain, the story of their interest in Palestine starts in a strange place. I mean, the story does not begin in a war room, doesn't begin in a parliamentary debate. It doesn't even actually begin in Britain. The story begins with one massive technological change and an equally massive social change. The story begins in Mainz, modern Germany, where in the 15th century, a man named Johann Gutenberg became the first European to create a printing press. This innovative technology allowed for the written word to spread like wildfire all across Europe. I mean, to call this one of the most important technological achievements in European history is no exaggeration. Now, this is where the story gets really interesting. So... In the Canadian education system, we're sold a pretty romantic story where this improvement in print technology directly bleeds into the Enlightenment. And for those of us who are paying attention in social studies, I think we leave school with an impression that everyone in Europe who could read, I mean, universal literacy was far from like a reality at this point, but everyone who could read was reading Plato and Aristotle and Hobbes and Newton and all these amazing works of philosophy and physics. And while some people were obviously reading and writing about physics and philosophy and governance and what have you, the vast majority of people were not. And this brings me to my next point. The social upheaval consuming Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries came in the form of the Christian Reformation. I think the easiest way to understand the difference between Protestant Christianity and Catholicism is as follows. Traditionally, Catholicism preached a gospel wherein the Pope, personally, and the Church more generally, were God's representatives on earth. As such, if you were in need of spiritual direction— You could visit your local parish, and the priest could impart upon you the wisdom that he has acquired through years of deep theological study and understanding. Well, by the 17th century, many in Europe had grown, let's say, disillusioned with the Catholic Church's bloat and endemic corruption. I mean, to tie it back to what I was discussing earlier— the various peoples of Europe were beginning to feel like this institution was a distant relic of a bygone era. The Catholic Church was a Roman, when I say that I'm referring both to the city and and to a legacy from the Roman Empire, it was a Roman institution. And this was no longer a story that the British found compelling. By contrast to Catholicism, the Protestant movements, which emerged from the Reformation, preached a more personal relationship with God that was accessible to essentially every Christian. The Protestant tradition, broadly speaking, preaches a message of spirituality that should be explored on a personal level. Christians may take it for granted today, but please, I mean, if you are a practicing Christian, just Understand that the very idea that people could bypass the middleman and reflect on the Gospels themselves 
was absolutely revolutionary in 16th, 17th century, 17th century Europe. And from this emerged concepts like WWJD, of what would Jesus do? It's a very Protestant concept that encourages the worshiper to engage in an important, personal, but I mean, ultimately subjective reflection of how they can best manifest the teachings of the Gospels in their personal life. But to stand a chance, to stand a chance at answering that question, what would Jesus do? Christians had to familiarize themselves with Jesus. And what better way to do that than to study the most famous account of his life? And so simultaneously, while printing costs were plummeting due to the advent of the printing press, copies of Europe's most popular book, the Bible, found their way into nearly every household in Britain. And now, free from the real or perceived constraints of the Catholic Church, the English began to read the Bible. Christians of Britain learned about the life of Jesus, but they also learned about his world. Bethlehem, Nazareth, the Galilee, and of course, Jerusalem. They internalized these names, imagined their landscapes, reflected on Jesus' experience in this land, and they did so just as the Catholic Church's spell over Europe was beginning to break. But the Bible features more than just the life of Jesus. And so while the British were falling in love with Palestine, they also fell in love with other heroes of the Bible, the ancient Hebrews. And from this, an amazing phenomenon emerged in the 16th century. We are naturally the protagonists in our own story. I mean, nobody, nobody writes themselves as the villain in their own story though you may be the villain in somebody else's story. So imagine then that you as a people, just imagine this, that you as a people begin formulating the basis of your national story, the story of your origin, the story that will give you a common understanding of the past and present and a common vision for the future. And so when you're creating this origin story, you start in a sensible place. You start in your past. Well, you dig and dig through your nation's past, but you discover that your central characters don't really fit. <laughs> it turns out your ancestors aren't the heroes you were hoping for. 16th century Britain ran into this problem. And the problem was that in the absence of the old story, the Roman Catholic story, the English dug into their roots and found things that they weren't really all that proud of. I mean, the Celtic people of Britannia, the, the indigenous people of the British Isles and the, the ancestors of the British people, they were pagans, they were polytheists, they were heathens. And so that wasn't a story that any good God-fearing Christian was interested in incorporating into their narrative, at least not in those days. These were people... The, the polytheists, the heathens, these, these pagans, these were people that sounded more like the villains in the story of the Bible. And they wanted to sound more like the heroes in the story of the Bible. As a matter of fact, they wanted to be the heroes of the Bible. With that in mind, just try to predict what happens next. What happens when a people simply discover an existing story that captures their imagination more than the story of their actual ancestors? What happens when they discover places, names, heroes, villains that speak to their sense of purpose and identity, to their common understanding of the past and present, and delivers for them a vision of the future that they can get on board with. Well, in the case of Britain, 
they as a people fell in love with the Bible. So much so, in fact, that they wrote themselves into it. That does not mean that they anglicized the place names of the Bible. No. They Hebraized the English people themselves. So believe it or not, I mean, by the 17th century, it was a commonly held belief in England that the English were the ancient Hebrews. They were, their mythology here, the descendants of the Israelite kings and the inheritors of their legacy. As historian Shlomo San puts it, quote, Some English scholars of the period searched for roots that would link them biologically to the land of Canaan. Others conjectured that the inhabitants of the British Isles were the authentic descendants of the Ten Lost Tribes. Almost the entire elite subscribed to this trend, and the Bible was the only thing read in many homes. The Book of Books was also made the focus of the prestigious educational framework, and many children of the aristocracy were introduced to biblical heroes even before being taught the names of England's ancient kings. Often, too, they learned the geography of the Holy Land before learning the borders of the kingdom in which they themselves were born and raised. End quote. Now, before you laugh too hard at the hubris of the British, just keep in mind that this was at a time where things like genetics were kind of a completely unknown as a field of study and anthropology and, and genealogy were often self-serving. So cut them some slack. I mean, don't, don't judge them too harshly. But this is a perfect example of the power of stories. I've said it time and time again, and, and I hope you don't get sick of me saying it, but stories don't have to be true to be effective. And as the true descendants of the tribes of Israel, who are now increasingly familiar with the places of the Bible and the prophecies that it contains, many began to believe that Britain should return to its ancestral land. That is, that the ancestral land of the Hebrews, the Holy Land. And there, right there, there you have the origin of Christian Zionism. And then, back then, just as now, Christian Zionism maintained two simultaneous streams of thought that most of us believe to be mutually exclusive. These two streams of thought are the lionization of the ancient Hebrews and repugnance for the contemporary Jew. The British of this time, they adopted a worldview that saw the British as at least as Israelite as the Jew himself, but more civilized since they had accepted Christianity. And to some British Christian Zionists of this time began writing about establishing a British Palestine with the Jews, with the end goal of both fulfilling the prophecies of the Bible and converting those Jews to Christianity. Well, at the time that these ideas are bouncing around in England, the Ottoman Empire was near the peak of its power. And so England could commit to conquering the Holy Land one day, but that's about it. Kind of remains a fantasy at this point. But by the time Napoleon's invasion rolls around in 1799, the Ottoman Empire is not quite as formidable as it once was. Britain was dragged into Napoleon's invasion of Palestine out of a desire to protect its interests in the region. But once the dust settled on Napoleon's invasion, it was Christian Zionism that kept the English coming back to Palestine. In the first decade of the 19th century, the Palestine Association was formed. On the surface, this was an organization with a scholarly and scientific purpose. It was dedicated to understanding things like 
like the geography and toponymy of Palestine. But in reality, the primary aim of the Palestine Association was to identify the places in Palestine that correspond with the events of the Bible. And, in turn, to teach the English this biblicized version of Palestine. And that's quite opposed to the Palestine that was experienced by its native inhabitants. The Palestine Association was all of the things it said it was. It was scholarly, and it was scientific, and it was educational. But more than all of those things, it was an expression of Christian Zionism. It was a masterful case of how institutions often manifest the ethos of their nation. And once the British institutions began arriving in Palestine, the British themselves felt more comfortable in coming as well. Christian pilgrimages began to pick up in the early 19th century, and there is one incident in particular that represents I guess, sort of like a pivotal pivotal moment in Christian religious tourism in Palestine. I'll let Elon Pape share this story. Elon Pape tells the story of, um, of a doctor, a physician named Richard Richardson, who uh, cured the Imam of Al-Haram, the Imam of Masjid Al-Aqsa, Omar Al-Husseini. He cured him of a, an eye infection, and I, I want to read for you what happened next. So, quote, Richardson was also the first European to be admitted to the Haram al-Sharif, more or less formally, that is, with the permission of the Sheikh al-Haram, who happened to be Omar al-Husseini. Wearing a black turban lent him by Omar, the Scot sneaked into the Haram in the dead of night. Later, he complained that he had been unable to appreciate the beauty of the place in the dark, and Omar relented and smuggled his guest into the place in broad daylight in 1818. But Richardson did not keep the secret, and Omar came to regret the gesture, because then more Europeans asked to be allowed in. His consent suggests either that he was aware of the changing circumstances, or that he did not consider the matter vitally important. End quote. Now, that may not seem like a significant incident to everyone who's listening, but to many who are listening, they'll be able to identify that that was the moment where Europeans in particular began to encroach upon a space that Muslims had considered sacred and continue to consider sacred. If you've ever wondered why Palestinians in particular hold the Al-Aqsa compound, Al-Haram al-Sharif, why they guard it so jealously, just keep listening to these episodes. You'll start to see what unfolds. In any case, in addition to Christian pilgrims, explorers and adventure seekers, Palestine was also awash with Christian missionaries by the 1820s. So all of this put together starts to paint a clearer picture. Napoleon's invasion created the space for institutions like the Palestine Association, like missionary organizations, to become involved in the Holy Land amid a climate of increased interest in Palestine. Now, interestingly, the French colonial experience in Palestine is really very different from that of the British. I'm not going to spend nearly as long on the French as I did on the British. I mean, for one thing, I think I've maybe spent too much time on this already, but also I sort of already introduced how the French ended up in Palestine a few episodes ago when I introduced the capitulations. The capitulations were the sort of diplomatic immunity granted to the French and to other Christian European kingdoms. But there are some very important things I haven't mentioned yet. So for one, the capitulations meant that they, the French, that they were not Ottoman subjects. And so they were not part of 
of the Ottoman Christian Millet. They reported then to the French consul in Sidon. And here when I say they reported to the French consul in Sidon, I'm sp- referring specifically to the French merchants in the north of Palestine, in places like Acre, like Akka. They communicated directly with the French consul in Sidon, who then communicated directly with the governor. Even in the pre-colonial era, that gave the French merchants access to corridors of power that were, by and large, unavailable to the indigenous population of Palestine. So prior to Napoleon's invasion, the French community in Acre did not interact much with the local population. Part of that was actually by design. The monopoly, that is the, the cotton export monopoly instituted by Zahar al-Umar, was designed to limit French merchant interaction with the Fallahin. Their presence in the region then appears to be primarily for the purpose of commerce. And the degree to which they took orders from the metropole, that is from the French Republic, is is unclear. In fact, so far as I can tell, these merchants had every intention of staying and believed themselves to be a unique community. I mean, okay, so for starters, they didn't call themselves a community or a group or a guild they called themselves a nation. So the group of French merchants in Acre refer to themselves as the nation of Acre, or the nation of Sidon, or the nation of Beirut. The few dozen merchants who lived in any one of these places, they often brought their families, they brought a priest, a few artisans. Before Napoleon's invasion, The diary entries of these merchants mostly tell a story of a community on the periphery of local life, watching Palestinians as outsiders looking in. However, after Napoleon's invasion, the French merchants of the Levant begin to intervene more directly in the affairs of Palestine. I'll talk about that more next episode. But now that I've gotten you caught up on what is happening in Europe at this time, we can shift our focus back to Palestine. You may have noticed throughout this tale, throughout this massive narrative of Palestine and its inhabitants and its rulers and social classes, there are many smaller stories that emerge. So we have stories of towns and and their social classes, right? Like such as the Nabulsi merchants or the Jerusalem notables. Or we have stories of individuals like Zahir al-Umar and Jazzar Pasha. Pretty soon, I hope to be telling you detailed stories about the institutions that shaped modern Palestine. But for me to open the next chapter in Palestine's history we need to close this current chapter. And it's a chapter that can be thought of as a, as the strongman era. So it was a time when local leaders rose to power by sheer force of will and took advantage of the Ottoman Empire's either unwillingness or, at this stage, their inability to limit their power. This system does not survive past the 1840s, and when it dies, the city of Acre dies with it. So this, then, is the fall of Acre, and it is the fall of its strongmen. And this discussion cannot possibly conclude without the introduction of a few fascinating characters. So let's pick up right where we left off. Jazar Pasha ruled and died, with Acre still firmly holding its place as the Levant's dominant port city. Yet one thing we did not spend nearly enough time on last episode was the fascinating character of Jazar Pasha himself. I already mentioned his bizarre sort of rags-to-riches origin story, but there is so much more to him that needs to be said. <laughs> 
So let me start off by saying that accounts of Jazar's rule can be very confusing, and that is probably a reflection of the complexity of his character. So on the one hand, Jazar was well into his 60s when Napoleon laid siege to Akka, and yet numerous first-hand accounts report how Jazar personally took part in the fighting, and by personally took part, I mean hand-to-hand sword fights against invading French soldiers. These same sources share how he reveled in the heat of battle, so you can imagine then that Jazar became a, a type of folk hero in 19th century Palestine, and yet modern Palestinian historiography doesn't really work to claim him. There is, for example, no real biographical work on the life of Jazar Pasha, and that probably has something to do with the fact that Jazar, the hero who defeated Napoleon, was a bit of a lunatic. (laughs) Accounts of contemporary Arab travelers report that during Jazar's rule in Akka, the city was filled with people missing fingers or limbs, all of whom were victims of Jazar's wrath. He was prone to violent outbursts and ruled with an iron fist. And yet, he was also considered outrageously generous and spared no expense in feeding the needy, building water fountains all throughout Acre. Here is one account that captures the softer side of Jazar Pasha. Quote, Simple in his manners, he becomes popular and sometimes familiar with the inhabitants of Acre. Charitable and compassionate in appearance, he himself administers to the poor the remedies which he believes to be efficient for their ills. He seats the unhappy next to him, and they show complete confidence in him. He consoles them with his talk and nurtures them with his own hand. He has constantly enormous pots of rice in his palace for the destitute and the old. He has money to distribute to them every week with the greatest regularity. End quote. European accounts, by contrast, generally describe Jazar as a bloodthirsty psychopath. And though many modern historians believe that their accounts to be Orientalist exaggerations, their accounts may reflect, in fact, the tensions between Jazar and the French merchants, one thing is for sure, Jazar believed that violence and fear were legitimate tools in maintaining his rule. As he himself put it, quote, This is how I have maintained for 30 years, in spite of everybody, complete possession of all of the land between the Orontes and the estuary of Jordan. End quote. Now, putting his character aside for a moment, there's something else that people of Acre would have noticed about the rule of Jazar especially after living under Zahar al-Umar for nearly four decades. Jazar himself was not a Mamluk, and that is a, kind of a type of soldier, slave. And yet, he ingratiated himself with them, and really ruled in their style. Now, that is significant because the type of familial ties that one commonly associates with the Muslim world, local tribal alliances, family ties, blood ties, well, that was largely lost on the Mamluks by design. They had no loyalties except to each other. There, then, couldn't be a starker contrast to Zahar al-Umar than Jazar Pasha. Zahar al-Umar His whole rule relied on local alliances, bonds of marriage, essentially traditional Arab institutions of power. And so Zahar al-Umar saw the fallahin, the peasants, as his people. He was indigenous. And so in his own words, Zahar al-Umar said, quote, When the fallah is productive, the land will be fertile and all the country with it will be prosperous. 
How often were the fellahin oppressed before, but my wealth suffices me when I see the peasants prosperous in my country. End quote. And to that end, he invested in the towns under his rule. Jazar, by contrast, had a more, well, let's call it kinetic, understanding of power and administration. It was not uncommon under the rule of Jazar Pasha for merchants to be extorted or to have their property confiscated. As historian Thomas Philip describes it, quote, Rather than establishing alliances, as Zahir al-Umar had successfully done, he, Jazar, preferred to smash local structures with military force and place his military commanders as mutasallims in such regions, and then by sheer force of repression ensure payment of taxes and obedience. End quote. I mean, the differences between the two don't stop here. And this next bit is perhaps the most important difference. Zahir al-Umar, for the most part, did not rise up against the Ottoman Empire. But having said that, he imposed himself upon the high port and forced them both to deal with him and accept his legitimacy. Jazar, on the other hand, he came into the governorship of Sidon and the leadership of Akka as an Ottoman appointee, and he served at the pleasure of the sultan in whatever realm was granted to him, and ceased exerting his influence when the sultan no longer wished him to do so. And we see this in numerous times, that Jazar became governor of Damascus and ceased being governor of Damascus at the behest of the sultan. I'll finish off this little rant by reflecting on this last fact, that while Jazar was probably better and more convenient for the Ottoman Empire, Zahr al-Umar was unquestionably better for Palestine. And this is not the last time that we, or the Palestinians, would have to reflect on this issue, the issue of how to best rule Palestine. Well, in any case, when Jazar's brutal rule came to an end, his successor, Suleiman Pasha, came as a kind of respite to the people of Acre. Like Jazar, Suleiman was not indigenous to Palestine, but his general apprehension about subjugating his population to violence earned him the epithet Al-Adil, the just. And since Suleiman did not rely heavily on violence and coercion, he significantly reduced military spending, which was significant because Jazar's military expenditures were extraordinarily high. Bishara Dumani describes the situation as follows, quote, Suleiman Pasha gutted al Jazar's formidable military machine and relaxed his political control over Acre's dependencies. According to his sympathetic scribe, Suleiman Pasha preferred diplomacy over violence and rarely interfered in the affairs of his appointees. End quote. So, this was a welcome change for the people of Acre but also for other regions of Palestine, such as Nablus, whom Jazar Pasha had spent decades trying to subdue, and frankly with little success. But while Suleiman Pasha's rule was perhaps less repressive, his reputation as a just ruler may have been contested by the peasants of that time. Calling him just may have proven to be just a little bit generous. Throughout the story of Palestine's north and its rule under Zahir al-Umar, Jazar, and now Suleiman, I've passingly referred to this cotton monopoly, but I never really explained what that meant. So here it is. The rulers of Acre, beginning with Zahir al-Umar, devised a system wherein nearly all cotton was sold to them personally. They would then, in turn, sell the cotton to the French merchants in Acre, sometimes at a 100% return. The French merchants, for their part, maintained access to European markets 
and so could not be bypassed. This arrangement worked for everyone, since year after year, the price for cotton kept going up and up. And so, Acre and its rulers became very wealthy, with both the monopolists, the rulers of Acre, and the French merchants earning a fortune in the process. This is the monopoly that transformed Akka, Acre, into the most important port city in the entire Levant. Unfortunately for Suleiman Pasha, he had the bad luck of ruling at a time where for the first time in decades, the price of cotton was not just stagnating, but going down. And the reason for that was the influx of American cotton into the European market. American cotton, which, as I hope you already know, was being produced at very low prices due to America's use of slave labor. And so, Suleiman Pasha had the misfortune of ruling after Jazar Pasha had essentially expelled the French merchants of the Acre region, making the business of exporting cotton that much more challenging. The price for these economic downturns was paid for by the peasants, who were forced to sell their cotton to the Acre Monopoly, run by Suleiman Pasha, at prices so low it no longer made sense to harvest. I think by this point you can see that Akka's days as the prime city in Palestine and the top city in the Levant those days are numbered. Well, while all of this is going on, south of Akka was Muhammad Abu Nabut, the strongman of Yafa, whom I mentioned at the end of the last episode. And I mentioned that he had laid the foundation that allowed Yafa to become the economic and cultural hub of 20th century Palestine. And his ambitions to rival the rule of Acre and to become governor of the Sidon Sanjak, to which Acre belonged. I mean, this was no secret. And when Suleiman Pasha grew old, Abu Nabut did his best to position himself as his successor. And yet, despite having the qualifications, despite having resurrected Yaffa from the dead, Abu Nabut was passed over. I mean, not only was he passed over, he was passed over for a relative nobody. The appointment of governor of the Sidon Sanjak was given to the son of a neo-Mamluk, a young man named Abdullah Pasha. And now I get to introduce to you one of the most fascinating characters of this entire era. You see, Abu Nabut does not become the ruler of Acre, nor does he become the governor of Sidon. Because by the time Suleiman Pasha dies, Abu Nabut is not the most powerful man in Palestine, nor is Abdullah Pasha, nor are any of those neo-Mamluks I keep mentioning. Palestine's most powerful man is a Sephardic Jew named Haim Farhi. Now, while that hangs in the air for just a moment, let me say this. For those not familiar with Islamic history, or for those who get their Islamic history from Breitbart, you may be surprised to find that a Jew rose to such great heights under Islamic rule. But this was actually quite common in the Muslim world. Zahar al-Umar's top advisor was a Greek Orthodox Christian named Ibrahim al-Sabbagh. And in the, t- and in the acre of Zahar al-Umar, of Jazar, and of Suleiman Pasha, the number of Christian and Jewish advisors is actually disproportionately high. I mean, it's so high that it requires an explanation. The common thinking in the time among the ruling elite was that Christian and Jewish minorities 
did not have the extensive familial and tribal connections that Muslims of equal rank and qualifications would possess. Subsequently, a Christian and Jewish advisor who is thrust into a position of power should theoretically be completely loyal, since the man they are serving is their entire source of power. Now, with all of that said, and as history has shown, things didn't always work out that way. Even when it did, even when all of this worked, it was very rare for someone to rise as high as Haim Farhi. This is the story of Haim Farhi's incredible rise and tragic fall from grace. Haim Farhi was a Jew from Damascus and came from one of the most powerful families of the time, the, the Farhi family. So he arrives in Acre at the behest of Jazar Pasha in the 1790s, and Jazar is in need of a finance minister he can trust. And in the 1790s, Jazar Pasha had muscled Acre's French merchants out of the city, significantly reducing his cotton exports, and thus reducing his income. At the same time, Jazar had maintained an enormous military. This created a classic economic puzzle that someone shrewd needed to solve, and Haim Farhi was the man for the job. He is what some historians have called a financial wizard. Farhi successfully helps Jazar overcome his financial woes and becomes one of his most trusted and senior advisors. This continues throughout the entire rule of Suleiman Pasha, whom Farhi helped in enforcing a clever innovation on the existing cotton monopoly. Farhi's monopoly differed from the previous monopoly in that it allowed local artisans and local merchants to access cotton directly from the peasants, while limiting access to foreign merchants. This, he posited, would allow local ec economic activity to thrive. But as an outsider, both in that he was a Jew and that he was from Damascus, I think Farhi's position could fairly be described as precarious. Though it was not radical or out of place at the time, it was precarious nonetheless. And he made extensive plans to ensure his own political survival. For one, the Jewish population of Acre exploded in the years coinciding with the peak of his power. Farhi, it seems, wanted to surround himself with some allies. Well, finding allies is easy when you're at the top. I mean, I'm sure he had no problem bringing Jewish families over under his tutelage. But if you think that one can acquire that kind of power without making a few enemies, you would be mistaken. And over in Damascus, in Farhi's hometown, the Christian Orthodox Bahari family fill an almost identical role to the one he plays in Acre. The Bahari's were previously in Acre during the time of Dahar al-Umar, under the patronage of their co-religionist and top advisor to Dahar al-Umar, Ibrahim al-Sabbagh. While the Bahari's hated Jazar for being part of the system that brought down their friend and patron, Dahar al-Umar, and they hated Haim Farhi. And it seems that the feeling was mutual. So mutual, in fact, that at one point, the two families drag their respective patrons into a full-blown war. So just imagine this lone advisor having the power to take the most powerful leader in the region and drag him into a war. This alone is testament to the cunning of Haim Farhi. But it is also testament to the religious tolerance in this region in the late Ottoman Empire. I mean, not only was this unthinkable for a Muslim in Christian Europe at this time, I mean, you, could, you couldn't imagine a Muslim being the financial advisor or finance minister in, in, 
any of the French provinces. I would go so far as to suggest this is unthinkable for a Muslim in secular enlightened Europe today. I mean, in any case, contemporary Arab historians were not exaggerating when they described Haim Farhi as Sharik al-Hukum, the one whom the ruler shares power with. The French merchants of the time, they had another way of describing him. They wrote things like, quote, the Jew who rules in the name of Suleiman Pasha, or the, quote, Jew who under the title of director of taxes is truly in charge of the whole Syrian coast, end quote. There are plenty of entries like this, plenty. And even though those words were written more than 200 years ago, I could just about hear those merchants hiss as I read their notes. I swear their anti-Semitism just oozes through the page. Anti-Semitic or not, both Arab and French contemporaries testify to the enormous power of Haim Farhi. Under Suleiman Pasha, Haim Farhi had grown so powerful that he could publicly reprimand Muslim officials without fear or recourse. On one occasion, a man named Mas'ud al-Mabi, from a very powerful family, he is the chief tax collector of a town called Atlit. He was on the receiving end of one of Haim Farhi's tirades. Just listen to this. This is Haim Farhi speaking, as written by a scribe. He said, quote, Every single one of you remains a donkey who does not know anything about this world. But when God bestowed his grace upon you and removed the horseshoes from your feet, you believed you had become something important. You sat in the meetings of wazirs and rulers and interfered in affairs that were none of your business. You opened your big mouth without discerning what came out of it lest it would be said that Haim put his intelligence on the same level as the limited intelligence of so-and-so. He doesn't even say the guy's name, he just calls him so-and-so. I would show you how I would deal with you, impudent blabbermouth. Get up, bother your peasants with your insights, and join their company. End quote. Throughout this part of the episode, if you were imagining some feeble Jew trying desperately to fly under the radar while the wheels of history and power turned over his head, get that image out of your head right away. Haim Farhi was a shark. He was a beast. Make no mistake about it. And one would have to be. You'd have to be to have survived the court of Jazar Pasha. Anyway, let's return to the early 19th century where an ailing Suleiman Pasha now lays on his deathbed. As I mentioned, Abu Nabut was a serious contender for Suleiman's seat. But what he could not contend with was the fact that Haim Farhi had been grooming a young Abdullah Pasha from childhood. And when Suleiman grew ill, Haim Farhi flexed the extent of his power. First, in 1818, he had Suleiman Pasha move against Abu Nabut and depose him. After removing this important rival from Yaffa, he leveraged his relationship with Ezekiel al-Baghdadi, a Jew from Baghdad and bursar of the high port in the capital, and managed to get his protege, Abdullah Pasha, elected to the position of governor of Sidon, ruler of Akka. In January of 1820, Haim Farhi achieved the unthinkable. Through cunning, grit, political intrigue, he managed to have a governor of his own making, shaped by his own two hands, sit upon the throne. 
a governor who, approximately six months later, had Haim Farhi strangled to death and had his body thrown into the water. So what went wrong? Well, for starters, there is no doubt, no doubt, that Abdullah Pasha owed his position to the behind-the-scenes work of Haim Farhi. Haim groomed him, trained him, and propelled him to the highest levels of power. The only problem for Haim is that Abdullah Pasha knew that, and Haim Farhi made no attempt to conceal it. Haim Farhi's tenure ran the rule of three governors, arriving in Acre in the 1790s until his death in 1820. And, you know, I've I've often said the worst kind of lie is the one with which you deceive yourself. Well, to put it simply, Haim Farhi began to believe his own hype. Being known for so long as, as Sharik al-Hukum made him lose sight of the fact that his power ultimately depended on the governor's blessing. Despite his unbelievable influence, Haim did not command an army or a large tribe. And so were he to lose the favor of the governor, he was virtually defenseless. It is precisely this reason that motivated Haim Farhi to have Abdullah Pasha installed in the first place. I mean, so long as he commands the attention of the young Pasha, things should be fine, right? Well, that brings me to Haim Farhi's other problem, and I swear you can't make this stuff up. Haim Farhi was not the only one whispering into the ears of the young Abdullah Pasha. It appears as though the young Pasha was more, I suppose, religiously inclined than his predecessors, and some historians have suggested that he even belonged to a Sufi order. Well, one of his religious and personal advisors was a certain tax collector from the town of Atlit named Mas'ud al-Madi. If you don't recognize the name, it's the tax collector whom Haim Farhi had compared to a donkey and had publicly humiliated. Sheikh Mas'ud <laughs> Sheikh Mas'ud began convincing the young Pasha of one simple fact. If Haim Farhi put you in power, he could take you out. Well, if Sheikh Mas'ud loaded the gun, Haim Farhi pulled the trigger himself. According to a French consul named Rufin, one night in the midst of it, of a heated exchange between Haim Farhi and, and Abdullah Pasha, Haim Farhi told Abdullah Pasha to his face that his rule would not have even been possible were it not for him. And this was the final straw. Shortly thereafter, the financial wizard turned puppet master died a most unceremonious death. The story of Haim Farhi's death is sometimes used to demonstrate the rise of Muslim fanaticism under the rule of Abdullah Pasha, but this is a very difficult position to take seriously, especially considering that Abdullah Pasha had Haim Farhi replaced by a Christian, a certain Yusuf Qardahi, and that was only after Haim's brother Musa had refused the position. Now, you would think that Haim Farhi's story ends with his death, but there is one more chapter in the story of this remarkable man. I mentioned earlier that the Farhis were a powerful family based in Damascus. Well, Haim's brother Solomon was enraged at the fate of his brother and went and appealed not just to the governor of Damascus, but to Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire. That is the highest religious authority in the empire. This then had the Sultan himself issue a firman declaring Abdullah Pasha an outlaw and commissioned an army to depose of Abdullah Pasha. 
So just to recap the significance of what I just said, a Muslim governor kills his Jewish advisor. That advisor's brother goes to the highest Muslim authority in the empire, and that authority sends an army to depose the Muslim governor. I mean, that really does say a lot, I think, about the times and the way that we have misunderstood them. Now, Solomon's efforts were eventually unsuccessful, but that's not really the point. But the point is that the highest levels of authority in the Ottoman Empire supported the effort. I mean, we live in a time where the Islamophobia industry has created a Muslim biggie man, wherein the more, quote, Islamic something is, the more barbaric it is. I mean, particularly in relation to anything regarding the Sharia and to Muslim treatment of non-Muslims and if you get nothing else from this episode, like I'm not telling you that the Ottoman Empire was paradise. That's not at all what I'm telling you. But if you get nothing else from this episode, just know that the Islamophobia industry has been feeding you a carefully crafted pack of lies for years. I decided to make Haim Farhi the sort of centerpiece of this story, of this episode at least, because He's sort of the glue that holds the whole episode together. I mean, he's one of the most remarkable notables of the early 19th century, and his rise and fall, as well as the way in which he's perceived through European eyes, I mean, it really does capture much of what is happening in the world at the time. Studying Haim Farhi gives us a view into sectarian tensions in Palestine, or, or the lack thereof, And it shows how Palestine's corridors of power functioned. And it reveals the overt European brand of anti-Semitism that will play such a big part in the story later. Well, left without a good financial wizard, Abdullah Pasha began to desperately seek out new revenue streams. And for this... He chose the tried and true method of squeezing out more taxes from the local population. In 1823, Abdullah Pasha arrived in Jerusalem and demanded not only more taxes from the Jerusalemites, but some of the personal property of the Husseinis. Tahir al-Husseini, along with his cousin Omar al-Husseini, were essentially the leaders of the family at that point. And they embodied the Husseini family tradition of cautious politics. However, (laughs) seeing as though Abdullah Pasha was not popular with the governor of Damascus or with the high port, they took the brazen step of launching a rebellion against Abdullah Pasha. With the support of Jerusalem's surrounding peasants, the rebellion was successful and Abdullah Pasha failed in his effort to extort the Husseinis. So at this point, it may sound like nothing significant happened in the reign of Abdullah Pasha other than the fact that he killed Haim Farhi. But there was one major accomplishment that Abdullah Pasha was able to put in his cap as an unprecedented accomplishment of all of the strongmen in the era of strongmen in Palestine. In March of 1831, Abdullah Pasha accomplished what Zahir al-Umar, Jazar Pasha, and Suleiman Pasha failed to do. Abdullah crushed Nablus. After 100 years of resisting the rule of Akka, Nablus finally submitted to the rule of Abdullah Pasha. But even this... Abdullah Pasha could not enjoy. So what he didn't know was that within months, the neo-Mamluks of Egypt, led by a certain Muhammad Ali Pasha, would emerge from their west and devour the Levant. Historian Thomas Phillips wraps up this story with this, quote, During the last months of Abdullah Pasha, during the last months, Abdullah Pasha lived underground with his family, when he finally emerged and surrendered, the history of Acre 
and its realm as a semi-autonomous region within the Ottoman Empire had come to an end. End quote. By 1832, Akka, once the most powerful city in the Levant, was in ruin. For the next 10 years, Palestine would be under Egyptian rule, and despite their relatively short stint at leading the Holy Land, the Neo-Mamluks will also have a tremendous impact on the history of Palestine. Oh, I am the